thing I left off with, I was talking about why we're stuck in a two-party system. I just wanted to hit on this one more time because I did it really quick at the end. Um, talking about the difference between a plurality and a majority. And uh, we mentioned Germany, right? When we learned about how Hitler came to power uh, using a plurality in a parliamentary system. This obviously allows more radical views to get into government. Whereas a majority, you're going to have less radical views find their way into government. Does that make sense? Hi. Yeah, kind of three, four. I mean, you got your electoral system versus your presidential versus parliamentary. You're only going to need to know two. That's all four. I just gave you that. Yeah, parliamentary system versus presidential system. Okay. If that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, sorry. Can you read your own? Okay. So president versus parliament. Yes. Yeah. I think but Daniel I can probably hear you. Too. Probably. I can. Yeah. Well, I'm surprised you can hear you because it's so freaking loud in here. I'm sorry. It's it's a Friday. No, it's Thursday. It's Monday. We call it Monday, Thursday. We have a service at church. Today. That's exciting. Well, it's actually pretty soft. Um, Our Friday night service is all the like our Thursday one, I mean, it's you always like the Yeah, that's the song part when they strip the altar. Like, yeah. like, you're like, yeah. oh, yeah. 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 and I see like three like, books. What? Did you get the picture? What? Those books? Yeah. Why? Go. Can I teach? <laughs> All right, so on page 63, we have a list of minor parties, yes? Okay, now we're going to talk about four different types of minor parties. How many different types of minor parties? Four. Four, okay? So this picks up after why we're stuck in the two-party system, okay? So now new header, minor parties, four types. All right, we're going to start with number one. Ideological parties. Or as George Herbert Walker Bush would say, ideological parties. Now, based on the name, you might be able to figure out a little something about this that Ideological parties are, are based on a particular set of beliefs, such as Marxism, or the Communist Party, okay, or socialism, okay, or libertarianism, which is really the longest, uh, well, I don't know, well, probably the most popular today would be the Libertarian Party, okay. Which generally believe in very little government, okay, uh, constitutional government, nothing beyond that. Now these are these parties rarely win, but they are long lived. Yes. All right. Good. Ideological number two, single issue. Parties, single issue, which if you look at the bottom two thirds of page 63, you can see a lot of those. The vegetarian party. Yes, <laughs> yes, the grassroots party. Marijuana. The, okay, uh, I've heard a lot about grassroots. Uh, grassroots, we'll Does talk about. Do I have a dual meeting? Uh, grassroots uh, is a political science term that means from the ground up, yeah. basically. And I'll talk about Was that. Was AOC elected for the grassroots campaign? I'm pretty sure she was. Grassroots is more of a movement than a campaign. Well, like, yeah, like she was part of the movement. <laughs> well, um, she, 
I mean, she primary. So she ran against a actually the Democrat from Brooklyn that she beat. Because winning that seat for a Democrat is easy. It's just which Democrat's going to win that. It's like the fourth district. Can't we know Republicans are going to win it? It's just which Republicans are going to win. It. So by defeating uh, the guy that had that seat, uh, who was actually pretty powerful uh, as far as like. He had been in a long time and so forth. Yeah, from a grassroots level, she campaigned hard, uh, worked on the ground in Brooklyn, uh, got other people to work with her and work for her. And yeah, she defeated a powerful member of the House of Representatives. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess in a sense you could say a grassroots campaign. I mean, most people, you know, do that when they run for office. So, uh, I think of grassroots more as a movement than a campaign. But we'll talk about it. Um, especially, uh, and actually we'll probably touch on it today. Okay. Um, so single issue. So, um, you see like the green party is a really good example, right? Uh, people that feel strongly about the environment. And so what generally happens here is these parties will bring attention to that issue. Okay. And then sometimes if they're lucky enough, one of the two major parties will adopt that issue. So if you look at the Green Party, would you say that one of the two major parties has adopted kind of the environmentalist stance? Yeah, yeah right. The Democratic Party. Yes. OK. Uh, now, with the pot party or the marijuana party, and you see there's both on here because those are regional. They're not national. Generally, these these parties are regional, um, or at least the ones at the bottom. Uh, so neither of the two major parties has officially adopted legalization of marijuana at this point, okay? There are people in both parties that agree with legalization or decriminalization of marijuana, um, but neither party has actually adopted it yet, okay? And, of course, many, I, I don't know how many states now have. Someone said something about Kansas. Uh, Kansas would probably be one of the last. Now, maybe medical, but medical marijuana, but um, I mean, Oklahoma's already done with medical marijuana. Okay, so you know, Oklahoma tends to be as conservative as more conservative than Kansas. So it'll be interesting. Um, okay, historically, you might have heard of some of these uh, single issue parties like the Free Soil Party, the Know Nothing Party. <laughs> yeah, from history last year. Yeah. Okay. The uh, third type of minor party is the economic protest. Economic protest. So this is really rooted in economic discontent. So when you see the economy really struggling, you may see some new parties or minor parties pop up um, temporarily. Now, these usually fade with better economic times. You know what I mean? So they're not permanent like ideological parties. They don't necessarily have a clear-cut belief that all these parties believe the same thing. They just want better times. So a couple examples here of economic protest parties historically. Uh, you might remember hearing of the Greenback Party. I know you've heard of the Populist Party, okay, or the Progressive Party, which is around the turn of the century, okay. Uh, more recently, did you remember hearing about this called Occupy Wall Street? This group called Occupy Wall Street. That you guys were probably like six, seven years old when this was going on. That was kind of a protest against Wall Street and, and that sort of thing. What about the Tea Party? Do you remember hearing about the Tea Party? Again, this is probably when, you know, this goes back to like 2010. So you guys were like I don't know, eight years old or something. Okay. Um, I was teaching honors government, and this Tea Party movement sprang up uh, probably 2009, 2010. And um, really the main thing they were upset about was government spending. We talked about national debt deficit and that sort of thing. And then um, when Obama was elected in 2009, they passed Obamacare. 
okay, which was the sweeping kind of legislation that would help kind of take the national government taking over health care. Now, it wasn't a universal system. We know that, okay? But it was a big step in that direction. And so that this kind of broke out. Well, there was a Tea Party rally down in the parking lot at Lawrence Dumont Stadium, okay? And uh, my honor students, I got permission to do this field trip with my honors government students. We made signs, okay, about the national debt and stuff like that. And I took my classes down to Lawrence <laughs> Dumont Stadium uh, to the parking lot. They're wearing, everybody's wearing their school uniforms. And so they had a band and, you know, music and speeches. I know. COVID. Okay. Now the Tea Party kind of went by the wayside. There's still some people that are kind of involved in the Tea Party, but the media really tried to marginalize them um, and use terms like racist and stuff like that. So at the beginning, it was it was kind of a grassroots movement, uh, as we were just talking about grassroots. And um, so uh, you know, it had an impact in the 2010 election. So Obama was elected 2008. In 2010, the Republicans took back control of both houses of Congress. Okay, so now there have been Tea Party candidates. I don't think there were any uh, Occupy Wall Street candidates that, like, so they weren't really officially an economic protest party, but it was an economic protest for sure. Okay, uh, okay. the fourth and final uh, minor party is uh, a splinter party. And this came up yesterday, actually, in our discussion. Uh, so this is when kind of a famous individual from one of the two major parties bolts and leaves the party and forms their own party. Teddy Roosevelt, good example. The Bull Moose Party, okay. Uh, the Progressive Party, that was a guy named uh, La Follet. Again, I think you guys were in lockdown last year when you would have covered that. Um, and then Wallace's Independent Party. So this one has a big impact. In 68, I talked about it yesterday, American Independent Party. This is where Wallace, who's a Democrat, left the Democratic Party, started the American Independent Party, and won uh, 68. He won 46 electoral college votes. Okay, and that was, he was segregationist. Okay. How many guys ever saw the movie Fort Gump? Okay, so you remember that part in the movie where the governor is standing in front of the University of Alabama schoolhouse door, and uh, you've got all these people, and the National Guard shows up, and he's got to move, and this, this young black woman walks into the school, and she drops a book. Forrest Gump picks it up and says, man, you dropped this. Remember that part of the movie? Yeah. Forrest Gump? Yeah, so that that was Governor Wallace, okay? And um, I'm actually going to be showing you guys next week when we get back. Um, I have two videos, uh, which will take two days, all right? One over the Republican Party from 1960 to 1992, and one over the Democratic Party over the same time period, which is really fabulous. Uh, it helps also cover some stuff that we didn't get to cover in history class, you know, we didn't get as far as I wanted. Um, so you, and it's really interesting to look at these guys because you kind of see history repeat itself. All right. And it's a very fairly done, like unbiased look at the two parties between these decades. Okay. And uh, so it, it has great value, in my opinion, these two videos. And uh, I'm going to show them to you. Okay. Next week when we get back. Cool. All right. So uh, these splinter parties, yeah. Uh, now, sometimes they win local or even congressional elections, but they follow that individual, okay? All right, now, we talked about four different mine types of minor parties. They actually, these minor parties play an important role. Some we've already alluded to, but let's list them. I have three roles of these minor parties. Say again. Yeah, 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 yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, like, bam, there's a head. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> the role of minor parties. Number one, spoiler. 
spoiler in an election. They don't win, but they can cause somebody to lose. I'm going to give you some good examples here, okay? Let's jump back to the year 2000, okay? Bush v. Gore. Okay, Al Gore. Al Gore, you got to say like one word. Like Bob Dole. Bob Dole. Al Gore. Where did this come from? This is, looks really old and faded. Let's see if it works. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, 2000. All right, this is close election. Kids, you can look over there at 2000. Tell me what the Electoral College vote was. Oh, man, snap. That's close. Remember, you got to have 270 to win, right? Now, what it all came down to, this state. Oh. Okay. Now, California, California, Florida, 20, I can't even read that. Does it say 29? Yeah, are getting bad. All right, so 29. Uh, this was 2000, so they may have had 27 at the time, okay? So they got 27. Now, Florida is a mishmash of the country, right? People retire from all over the country, go to Florida, and then you've got the Redneck Riviera through here or L.A., right? Lower Alabama. This region right here, this is L.A. That's where I grew up. I went to high school and so forth, okay? Um, so very conservative here, all right? And then you've got every race, you've got Cuban Americans, you got Puerto Ricans, you got Jews, you got whites, you got black. I mean, you got everything. Okay. Florida's a, a, a certainly a melting pot. Okay. And um, very evenly divided it is. So this was coming down. Uh, the governor at the time of, Cal, of New, uh, Florida was a guy named Jeb Bush. George W. Bush's brother was the governor of Florida, okay? And at 7 o'clock, Eastern time zone, okay? Let me show you this. All right? This is Alabama. This is Georgia. This, any country music fans? You want to hear? Way down yonder on the, on the what? Chattahoochee. Way down yonder on Chattahoochee. Right? I don't know who sings that. But this is Chattahoochee River. And this is the Eastern Time Zone. And this is the Central Time Zone. At 7 o'clock, CNN, which was the only cable news network at the time, called Florida for Al Gore. But the polls hadn't closed. In the Redneck Riviera, people were still in line. George Bush immediately sends out a press release saying, hey, we're not conceding this state. It's not over. People are still voting, and it's close. So new rule, nobody calls the state until all the polls in the state have closed. That seems just like common yeah. sense. I know. <laughs> Always want to get to be the first to get the scoop, though, right? So, damn the facts. Got to be first, right? Now, down here in Broward County, these people just can't seem to get their crap together, okay? Broward, Broward County, okay? You got Manatee County down here. I live in, I live in Scambia County, okay? Now, we get it. We got our crap together. But Broward County, these people are, uh, you yeah. know. So the ballots they're using for this election are like little punch cards. All right? So you get this card, and it's perforated, and you poke a hole, and it knocks the little chad or piece of paper out, and there's a hole there, and that they run it through a scanner and counts the vote. So, you know, kind of like a scan drop. Yeah? Okay? Problem. It was so close of an election, they were looking at some of these ballots, and some of the, the chads, the, the pieces of paper, were, like, hanging 
They weren't fully broken off. So do you count that as a vote? Yes. What about a dimple chat? Like one, like maybe it was an old person, you know, a lot of old people in Florida, right? Retirees <laughs> couldn't push hard enough to break through the perforation. And so you have a dimple chat. It's like pr- you can tell somebody pushed it, but it didn't go through. Do you count that as a vote? No. Okay. So, guys, in Wichita, Kansas, the Wichita Eagle came out with three different headlines that night. So the newspaper I got, the front page, on the east side of town was different than the one that was delivered to to school here over the election because they were trying to figure this out. So Gore sued for a recount for the whole state. The Florida Supreme Court said, yes, recount the whole state. Bush sued, and the U.S. Supreme Court against Gore saying, no, just recount Broward County. Everybody else has their crap together. So they recounted Broward County, holding these ballots up to the light to see if they're a vote or not. Okay? People with glasses like doing this. There's pictures of this. And uh, Bush won by, like, I don't know, 280 votes. Bush won the election. Okay? Now, there was a third. What's the moral of the story here? I, I got to get to this. There was a third-party candidate that year, a guy named Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader wrote a book back in the 1960s called Unsafe at Any Speed, uh, talking about vehicle crashes, and then went on to become an environmentalist and was a leading environmentalist in this country for many years, Ralph Nader. He ran under the Green Party ticket, and in Florida, there must be quite a few Greens. Because Ralph Nader got 3% of the popular vote in Florida. Now, you tell me, who was Ralph Nader taking more votes away from, Bush or Gore? Green Party? He was taking votes. If if Nader hadn't been running, those people would have likely voted for him. Gore, who himself is an environmentalist. Ralph Nader lost the presidency for Al Gore. Spoiler. Okay. You get it? Okay. Guys, back in 2016, Hillary versus Trump. The Green Party candidate. What was her name? It'll come to me. She got as high as 5% in some states of the vote. Do you think she drew more from Hillary, pulled more votes from Hillary or from Trump? From Hillary, right? I mean, might have helped cause her the election. Uh, Betsy, Betsy, is that her name? Jill, Jill Stein. Jill Stein ran for president in 2016, Green Party, okay? Um, now, so that's, that's one. Um, Ross Perot, remember Ross Perot? I told you about the yesterday. He got 19% of the popular vote in 92. Now, this one's debatable. Like, he got 19%. Did he pull more from the Democrats or did he pull more votes from the Republicans? That's a tough call. Okay. But Clinton won in 92 with 43% of the popular vote. Now, of course, the popular vote doesn't matter. It's who wins the electors for each state. Right. So but that's the lowest percentage any president has ever won of the popular vote and won the presidency because of Perot. Did he cost George W. Bush, Herbert Walker Bush, the election? Did Ross Perot cost him the election? Quite possibly he did. I think he did. I think Perot drew more from Republicans than Democrats personally. All right, so that's the splinter party, okay? And then the second roll of a minor party, oh, that's the spoiler, that's the spoiler, okay? Uh, it, your second role is innovator or reformer. Innovator or reformer.
And we kind of already talked about this. So people start a party because they're passionate about maybe it's a single issue like pot or the environment. And then one of the major parties says, hey, there's a lot of people that care about this issue. We're going to adopt it and make it our issue. Okay. And so you saw that with the environment. Okay. So hopefully the Democrats are thinking the more people we can bring into the party, the better. Let's get these greenies in here. Let's be strong on the environment. Does that make sense? So they, in the end, the single party gets what it wants. Yes, they've reformed the system. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. Some indication of I understand what you're saying, Mr. Ebright. It's good because then I can move on. Okay. Thank you very much. The third role of the Monument Party is that it stops disenfranchisement. There's a word for you. Stops disenfranchisement. Let me spell it for you. D-I-S-E-N-F-R-A-N-C-H-I-S-E-M-E-N-T. Disenfranchisement. Well, I hate that. <laughs> 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 the thing breaks the whole yeah, Grace, can we like, sing that? Any of you guys ever heard of this cat? What? Ron Paul. Uh, yeah. Any of you guys heard of Ron Paul? Some of you might have heard of Rand Paul. Rand Paul is a senator from Kentucky right now. Okay, he's a libertarian type guy. Okay, like his father, Ron, who is a OBGYN, served in the Texas, uh, served in the uh, United States House of Representatives from Texas. For about 30 years and ran for president, I think, four times. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Okay. Now, he is, I mean, died in the wool libertarian. But like Bernie Sanders, guys, Bernie Sanders runs as an independent. Okay. But he caucuses with which party? He meets with what party? The Democratic Party, right? So, Ron Paul ran as a Republican because that's closer to libertarianism than maybe the Democrats are, at least on most issues, but not all for sure. Okay. Now, so Ron Paul, this guy, he gets, he's like Bernie Sanders. He gets a lot of young people, even though he's old, Bernie Sanders, he gets a lot of young people excited to get out and vote because he's like, Pro, you know, legalization of drugs. That's what libertarians feel, right? And these, these people are like, yeah, let's go. Ron Paul for president. Okay. And so I remember going to the Kansas caucus in um, 2008. Okay. Down at uh, Century Two. All right. Where um, people were coming to vote to choose which candidate. So 2008, you had John McCain. Uh, running, and then you had other candidates running as well. McCain ended up getting the nomination and losing to Obama, right? That was 08. And so uh, I went down there to the to the caucus, and I saw these people. This is a Republican caucus. I see people with long hair, piercings on their face, beards, tattoos, and this is where I got the sticker, okay? <laughs> They're like handing out Ron Paul stuff. You know what I mean? T-shirts, hats, all this stuff. And I'm like, these people are Republicans, okay? Not typical of a Republican, you know, get up, thought, look, right? But it's cool, you know what I mean? Because these people got excited about politics where generally they're disenfranchised. They don't have anybody that, or a party that relates to them. You understand? They don't have something they feel like they can be part of. So sometimes these minor parties help alleviate that disenfranchisement, bring more people into civic engagement, if that makes sense. Okay? And God love Ron Paul. I love that guy. Okay? He's fabulous. He's straight talk. You know what I mean? He doesn't, he doesn't lie. He doesn't BS. He just tells you what he feels. He tells you what he thinks is the truth. 
and he's a good guy. And I like his son as well. Okay, Don't always agree with his son. But his son is true to his principles. And I like that. Even if you're a Democrat. And I respect Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, I disagree with almost on everything. But I respect him because he tells you who he is. He doesn't lie about it. This is what I stand for. I'm a Marxist. There you have it. Now we can choose. We know what he wants. Now you can choose. If you want that, there you go. But don't lie to me about it. You know, you don't lie to people about it. That's why I respect those people. The ones that say what they mean. You know, and whether you like Trump or not, that's what he said. Generally, just whatever came to in it popped in his head, he said it. <laughs> I respect that. And I used to respect that about Joe Biden. Joe Biden, man, that guy put his foot in his mouth so many times. You can make an hour long thing of gaps from Joe Biden in 47 years in Congress. Seriously, because he just said what was on his mind. He doesn't do that anymore. It's all scripted. Everything's scripted for him right now. Big time. Okay. I'd love to see Joe go off, off script. I'd appreciate that out of my president. But they're afraid what he might say. I mean, when he was vice president, Obama's like, hey, Joe, just shut up. Keep them out of the All right, so we got those roles of the minor parts, right? Okay, so they do play a role. I mean, you know, voting for them in a presidential race, I mean, is there a wasted vote? I mean, if you're a libertarian, is it a wasted vote to vote for a libertarian candidate? That's going to be have, have to be your decision. You know, I mean, you're going to have to make that decision. I know a lot of people don't like these two parties, Um but they are the vehicle, they are the vessel to get the type of public policies that you may want. Okay. We're stuck. We're stuck with them. Okay. So, like I said yesterday, you know, your best opportunity is to try and transform the party that is closest to you, to get it to be what you want it to be. Okay. Get rid of the ones, you know, the ones you don't want in there. And get the ones you want in there in there. Both policies and politicians. Okay. All right. So, guys, we talked about these political parties. I mentioned this yesterday. They have a name. Okay. Um, we have national parties, we have state parties, and we have local parties. So we're going to look at the apparatus, the machinery of these parties, and how they are, um, how they function. All right. So let's start at the top with the national parties. Okay, so here you go. New header. <laughs> organization of political parties. The organization. So at the national level, you have Republican National Committee and the Democratic National Committee. Okay, henceforth, RNC, DNC. Okay, and then any of these other national parties like the Constitution, Libertarian, Reform, they will have national parties as well. Okay, just on generally on a smaller scale. All right, so who makes up these national parties? Okay, they run the parties. Okay. The RNC has 100 members. How many states do we have? So how many do you think there's from each state? How many men from each state? And how many women from each state? One each. One woman and one man from each state make up the RNC. The Democrats, always being more democratic, have a hundred and thirty-three members. 
they do the same thing, where one man, one woman from each state, plus 33 at large member for larger populated states to be more democratic. Okay. They, these bodies, have two, have two, how many? Two major jobs. Two jobs. One, in August of every election year, they run the national convention. Now, these were virtual in 2020, which was horrible. Democrats went first. It was bad. I mean, you guys, you know, we did the Zoom thing, right? You know, can you imagine trying? Because these things generally are a lot of pomp and circumstance, like red, white, and blue, funny hats, signs, music, dancing, funny clothing. Woo! You know. Go Reagan, go Bush, go Clinton. You know, everybody's getting excited. Bringing all these Republicans and all these Democrats into one city and it's a big party. Okay, for four days, the convention. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes they are. These virtual ones were terrible. And the Democrats was abysmal. The Republicans had the ability to watch the Democrats do theirs and go, oh, we're not doing that. Okay, so their, theirs was a little bit more tolerable than the Democrats. You, you can't blame the Democrats. I mean, it's just, it's it's hard to do virtually like that, okay? Now, obviously, I figured out how to do virtual learning while we were doing it. Because you guys were just, like, locked in on all my videos. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Um, and two, raise money. Lots of money. Okay. Now, times are changing, Bob Dylan would say. Um, they still raise a lot of money, but today we have. We'll, and we'll get into this, what are called political action committees, interest groups that raise a lot of money outside the political parties, okay? Uh, this is really uh, changing, I would say, over the last 16 years. You know, with, with, with the Internet's fully up and running, and they figure out how to use it. Um, but raising money, okay? So my wife and I, and I know I did. I used to give money. They'd call me the RNC. They had my phone number. And I'd send them some money, you know, 25 bucks. Here you go. Okay. This was going back to the, the 90s. Okay. Early, you know, 90s. Uh, I worked on Jeb Bush's campaign when I lived in Florida, you know, putting up signs and stuff like that. The first time he ran for governor in Florida, he lost to Walken Lawton Childs, the Democrat. Because okay. everybody in the South used to be a Democrat. Okay? And so Bush lost. He won the second time he ran. Uh, but, um, yeah, so I, you know, I sent him some money. All right? By the year 2002, okay, basically 19 years ago, 20 years ago, I was done with the Republican Party. Okay? When you start looking at the national debt, all right, Reagan raised the national debt. In 1980, the national debt, which is now at $28 trillion, was $1 trillion. In 1980. By the time Bush, his first two years were over, he had added up close to $1 trillion in his first two years. And I'm like, I'm done with you people. I'm not, I'm voting for you because you're saying you're for smaller government. Yet you add entitlements that trillions of dollars will be spent on. 
I'm not giving you any more money because all you are is diet Democrats. Okay? That's what the Republicans are. Diet Democrats. So, they called for like 10 years. And then they finally quit calling. I told them every time they called, I said, hey, quit acting like Democrats. I'll give you money. Oh. And so, oh, we're sorry, sir. What, what exactly do you mean by that? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, you guys can figure out how, who I am, and, and that's okay. But uh, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm a registered Republican, but I'm not like a cheerleader for the Republican Party. You don't understand. Okay. All right, so the people that go to these conventions, they're cheerleaders, okay? All right, are we running out of time? Because you're putting your things Yeah, we have a minute left. Okay, we'll get to grassroots next week, okay? All right, because that's kind of the local party machine. All right, hey, happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter, Daniel. Happy Easter. Take care. You too.